Ooh, that looks tasty. Do you know what the problem is with cults these days? Um, bad catering. No, no. No one ever empties the litter box of the cats. No, no. Ooh, ooh, ooh. It's really hard to get blood stains out of ceremonial robes. The problem is investigators messing up our plans. So this time, our plan must be to corrupt the investigators and then our problems will be solved. Um, how does that solve the catering problem? Welcome folks, Day the Hunger Gamer is back with another game review. And today we are talking about... Seven Souls, designed by Connor McGoey, with art by Reese App Gwynn, and published by Inside Up Games. And I do apologize if I mispronounced that name. Now, what Seven Souls is, is it is a game in which you are taking on the head of a Cthulhu-laden cult with your cult-like plans to take over the world. And obviously there are investigators coming along to do their very best to thwart you. And you are going to do your best to corrupt the investigators and everybody out there so your evil plan will control the world. In order to do this, you'll be doing a bit of a blind bidding mechanic where you will be putting your agents out there where the different investigators are to attempt to corrupt them and obtain these resources down here being power, souls, and then corruption cards. And you're going to play until any of these three spots here have two different resources completely gone. And then at the end of the game, whoever has the most souls is going to win. Now, if you are not interested in how this game is played and just want to jump into my final thoughts, then you want to go to the timestamp on the screen right now for those of us still here. Let's talk about how this game works. The first thing that's happened is you are going to identify which of these three investigators is going to attack. And to do that, you're going to take the back of this investigator stack. You'll see it has investigators on the front and simply cycle it to the next card. And I'll point out that there are three different symbols on here as we kind of flip through there. And each of these correlates to one of these three manners that are out there. Then each player is going to go through their hand of agent cards here. And you can see at the top of each one, actually this one's a little bit hard to read on the camera, so let's grab a different one. There we are. And you'll see each one has a different number in the top corner, and that's going to relate to the initiative order that you activate in and then an ability that they're going to do as well. And each player is going to take three of those cards and place one at each of these three locations. And this is done in real time, and there is a slight benefit to being the first person to get your cards down. And for the sake of argument, I'll just stick these out here like so, like so, and like so. Then the next thing that's going to happen is we're going to flip them over one at a time, and you're going to order them by initiative going low to high. If there's ever a tie like we have here, it's they remain ordered in the order that they were flipped. Now, just for the sake of argument, had it been like this, I would have taken the four and put it to the front like so. Then you're going to go through in initiative order and activate. So in this case, this one here, these symbols tell me I get to take one of these souls from down here, and each one has a different number on the back. That's a one, though it could be a zero or a two also. I would get to take one of these cards right here, which will add to my combat deck. And then I would get to take one of these right here. And then that would move, then I would simply move that to the side for the moment. Now, before I continue on the next one, I'll also point out that right here, if this investigator were to attack, it would attack the first card in the stack or the lowest initiative. And in this case, since we have the book, and that matches what's over there, it will be attacking this player right here, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Now, these two players will have to compete to see who gets control of this agent, this character. And what they're going to do is they're going to go to their specific hand that they have of power cards. Now, I'll just pick these up from right here because it doesn't matter at the moment. And what they're going to do is they're each going to flip over one of these cards. Before they flip, they're going to have the choice of do they want to power up which means they can take some of their power and add it to their card. And then they would both flip over, and we'll see this player here has two corruption. This one only has one, so this one would win and would be the one that is allowed to activate that character, though the other player would then get this card right here. Had the player that only had a single corruption spent two power, then they would have wound up with a total of three, and they would have won. So then the player that won the loyalty test there would get to take this action, which in this case would be draw three more of these cards. 
I will also point out that as you go through, there's the ability to get these horror cards in your deck. You start with one, and some of the characters actually put more horror cards in your deck. And basically, these mean that when you're doing your draw on those loyalty tests or in a investigator fight, you get zero power. And any power tokens that you put in there also are wasted. Then you would do the same thing at this space and the same thing at this space there. After that, you have the investigator attack. And down here at the bottom, it's telling you what the investigator is going to take from you if they succeed in the attack. Though you do have the option of flipping over one of your corruption cards as a defense. In this case, that would defend one, so I would only lose one power. Now, the last thing that I need to point out is that these two characters here have this symbol on the bottom, and that means that they can attempt to corrupt the investigators, which are worth big points at the end of the game. And that's where these numbers over here come into play. This is telling me that I can flip four cards over in order to try to get four corruption on this investigator. If I succeed, I will have corrupted the investigator and I will get the points. However, if I fail, I will have lost all the various cards that I've been flipping over. Then in addition to that, you have various altars that you can go to and if you have the right amount of resources, you can spend those to claim those for points. There are spots down here which are as soon as you actually just have that amount of resources, you can claim those. And these are other ways to get points. There are also some secret objectives that you're going to start the game with as well. And you're going to play around and around like that until one of these locations is out of all of its resources in two of the different spots. So in this case, these two are empty, then the game would end at the end of that round. So that's how this game is played. So what do I like about this game? The first thing is the art is great. I love the art. I love the way the box organizes everything. It's great. It's just, it's right up my alley of this kind of creepiness, but cartoony and light and fun. It's just fantastic. The components are nice. All of that I think is just great. The next thing is, I think the way that you are bidding on each of these different spots on the board to try to figure out what it is that you want is really, really clever because you're putting the things out there, but you're trying to make sure that you don't have the same number as somebody else because that's bad because at the best, you're still going to lose resources that you need for later to try to be the one that wins. And it's possible that you get to do nothing, which is a super, super bummer. But at the same time, you're looking at where is the attack going to come? because you don't want to be the one that gets attacked, so that's going to also change what number you're going to put out there. But everyone else is changing the number they're going to put out there based on that too, so you're trying to kind of balance that as you go. Then when you combine that with the fact that you're going to have three cards that you don't get to play each turn, suddenly the choices that you make each round for each of those three spots is extremely important, and I really think that works really, really well. I also really like the simplicity of the challenges, how you just have your cards, you can flip them over and you get what you get and you can boost them and you're taking that kind of push your luck mechanic in there as you're again figuring out who's winning each thing and who's going to get to have the support of the acolyte or whatever it may be. Really, really cool. And then finally, I think there's a good strong variety in this game of different things that you can actually have out there that you're working with and the different choices you have in the initial setup as you're putting those things out. And I just think all of that really does work well. So, what are my quibbles with the game? And I really only have a couple. The first one is, I don't think this game works very well at a low player count. I played it some max player count games a while ago, and then more recently I played just a couple of two player games. And we had fun at two player, but it, it's not meant for that. I think you want at least three and probably four or five to really make this work because it's the bidding and the putting all the cards out there and as you're going through, people get to take different actions and you, you know, who are you going to give the, the, the super negative card to? So they're stuck with that. Well, a two-player game is them, the other person, but otherwise you have all these other people out there and say, ah, oh, well, who might, who do I think might be getting ahead or might be planning something that I can mess up? And I think, that is where this game is going to shine. There's a lot of people at the table that you're going to get to play off of and kind of mess, mess with. And then the other quibble that I have is this game does have the potential to where you have turns that you do nothing. And I know a lot of people really, really don't like that. It can be even to the point to where you two people have the same number out there, and that means one of you literally, you might not get to play it at all. 
And that's a real bummer. I mean, yes, you'll get one of their cards that come into your hand and you get to, you know, power yourself up a little bit, but all in all, that can be a real, real bummer. And also along with that, there's times when you might feel like you can't do anything because you have three cards that aren't there and then those are the cards that allow you to actually do anything that feels like that's what you want to do. And so it can feel at times like you can't do what you want to do. And it does happen more often than I would have expected where I felt like I'm shoehorned into doing one thing. Now, that might not bother you at all. But on the other hand, it might, because I do know a lot of people that just cannot stand it if they have a turn, or it's possible to have a turn in a quick game where they aren't able to do anything, and that can happen in this game. So there you have it, folks. That is Seven Souls. As always, if I made any mistakes in the rules overview, please let me know in the comments with a timestamp. I'll get that into the Klingon subtitles. If you found this video useful, please like, subscribe, and share. Thank you so much for watching. Have a wonderful, wonderful day.